Father, we do just pray, Lord, we, we thank you, God, that the injury to uh, former President Trump wasn't, wasn't as bad as it could have been. And then, Lord, we pray for victims, God, just innocent people going to a rally, and now they're gone forever. And God, just pray for them. Pray for our nation that, Lord, you would heal the, the anger and the, the hatred, God, that you would heal us as a nation and that we would be united under you. So, Lord, just use us. Use us as lights. And, God, as we study your word and, and uh, Lord, as we look at Revelation, and I pray that it wouldn't be just reading passages and getting some understanding of different symbols and different things, but, God, I pray we would meet you today as we read these verses that you would speak to our hearts, that you would change us, that you would move us, that you would motivate us. And Lord, we want to glorify you. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, as we uh, looked at last time, remember I told you chapter 12, 13, and 14 are kind of a break in the chronology of events that are going on, and we're kind of getting a picture, and especially chapter 12 and 13, we're getting kind of some main players of uh, the time of the tribulation and looking at them. Last week, we looked at the, uh, the dragon representing Satan and him, and then the woman meaning and uh, representing Israel. So a couple main players. Now we're going to move on and look at two more main players in this event. We're going to look at the Antichrist and the false prophet. The interesting thing in these two chapters is we come up with this satanic trinity uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, Satan is trying to put together, and you have Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, like we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that's kind of what's going on in, in Revelation. As we put this together, you know, I just, I just hope we can understand this whole idea of some people thinking we're getting better and better and we're gonna make this world better and better so Jesus can come back to a good world. I think we're kind of seeing even in our own day, that's really falling apart. And then today we're gonna see, hey, it's not gonna get better, it's gonna get worse and it's gonna get very, very difficult. And the sad thing about what we're looking at today is how many people are gonna be duped and drawn in to this false worship and false trinity. And it's just like, to me, it just like hits me really hard that we need to be men and women who are sharing our faith with, the, you know, with this generation and impacting this generation. So, having said that, verse one says, then I stood on the sand of the sea. Now, you know what, before we go on, I kinda have to address that, because some of your translations say, then he stood, or then the dragon stood, and you know, maybe that's a little bit better. I guess there's a lot of controversy which translation is more accurate, and I'm definitely not a translation, a, a, a scholar of original languages or, or some of the original documents. So here's the thing, you can choose whatever you want that to say. I kind of go with the dragon or he, and you can read it, then he stood on the sea. Remember, the dragon we just left off in verse 17 was enraged and he was angry and going after the woman. It says, and he stood on the sea and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea having seven heads and 10 horns and on his, uh, on his horns 10 crowns and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like a bear and his mouth like a lion and the dragon gave him power, his throne and great authority. So now we're looking at this other, this beast coming out of the sea. And exactly what does that mean? Some people, you know, want to identify that. Usually, usually in, uh, in symbolic language in the Bible, the sea refers to uh, Gentile nations kind of coming out of that. I don't know if that's that important just for this, but we have this beast, and by the way, the word there used is like a ferocious, horrendous, 
you know, beasts coming at you. So it's not just something gentle and kind. So he looks at this and he sees it and John describes him for us. And you know, this description, he says he has seven heads, 10 horns, and the horns uh, have crowns upon them and a blasphemous name. But then he says that he was giving a throne. So I think this beast represents two different, you know, quote, uh, entities. One would be the revived Roman Empire, and we'll talk about that in a moment, that it's going to come back and, and be part of the whole uh, raising up of the Antichrist. But it definitely represents the Antichrist. He's spoken of all through Scripture. Hey, here's some Scriptures you can kind of look up, and I kind of wrote these down. In, John, or in Daniel chapter 7, he's called the little horn. In Daniel chapter 9, he's called the prince that shall come. In Daniel chapter 11, he's called the willful king. And in John, John uh, chapter 5, he's the one who comes in his own name. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he's the son of perdition, the man of sin, the lawless one. In Revelation chapter 6, he's the, the rider of the white horse, and here he's the beast. So you kind of get an idea. This is a, a, a being who is going to come and take over, and we'll talk more about him. I think he's representing that. Now it does say that he has uh, 10 horns and seven heads, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more later. In chapter 17, if you kind of go there, you can check out some of the description. But in chapter 17 gives us a further description. So we're going to get more detailed about these heads and horns at that time. And I'm just going to kind of leave it there so you'll come back. So kind of leave you hanging and wondering what's going on and you can come back or you can read the Bible for yourself and find out. But listen, obviously, obviously there's something to do with, uh, I believe, the kingdoms of the world, we've talked about it before, that have uh, uh, been an influence in the whole development of especially Israel and what Israel's doing. We go back to the Egyptians and the, you know, the Egyptian kingdom, the Babylonian kingdom, the Assyrian kingdom, you know, and we go on and on and we look at it, the Greco-Roman, uh, or I'm sorry, the, the uh, not the, the, the Greek kingdom, but I'm thinking of the one before that, uh, the Medo-Persian empire all of these affected israel and i think that's what the heads represent are different kingdoms and we'll talk about it but right now notice what he does say he says now the beast in verse two was like a leopard and his feet were like a bear and his mouth uh and he and his mouth like the mouth of a lion interesting thing daniel when he had his vision of the different beasts if you remember he had the vision of the lion which the lion represented uh, uh, the, the kingdom of, uh, of the, uh, uh, Egypt, and then he had the Medo-Persian empire. I'm sorry, the lion was Babylon, then the, the next one was the bear of the Medo-Persian, and the leopard was the Grecian empire. So we have those, and it's interesting that now they're named again, only notice they're in reverse order. Instead of the lion, the bear, and, and uh, the leopard, you have the leopard, the, li the bear, and the lion. So Daniel's looking in the future. He's saying, hey, he's living in the Babylonian kingdom. There's going to be the Medo-Persian empire, and then there's going to be the Grecian empire. John's looking backwards at, he's looking at the uh, Grecian empire, the Medo-Persian empire, and then the, uh, 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 the Babylonian empire. Now, the interesting thing, he's living in the Roman Empire. So John's living at that time. So he lays out, this is who comes out of the sea. And again, it's kind of the idea, there's always been animosity towards Israel. No matter what empire you're talking about, they've always come against the nation of Israel and doing that. So then he says this in verse three, and I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. That's where it gets frightening. And hey, some people say that this is representative of, you have the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire goes away, and then it's resurrected, or the revived Roman Empire. Could be that, I don't necessarily go with that. I think this is 
the Antichrist, and he was literally wounded, and it looked like a mortal wound. I don't think he was raised from the dead, but I think there's a show like he was raised from the dead to draw people to him. Notice it says the whole world marveled uh, and followed the beast. So the world is gonna follow after this one who's gonna come in, and there is going to be a one world government. This individual is going to be so charismatic, so popular, so well-liked that everybody is going to get behind him. And, you know, it's, it's interesting, like everybody wants to know who he is, right? And, hey, here's the thing. I'm looking for Jesus. You can look for the Antichrist if you want. I'm going to look for Jesus because I want to follow him. But, hey, we're not going to be able to identify him. And, you know, the more I study the book of Revelation, here's what I'm convinced of. If God wanted us to know who it was going to be, he'd have put his name right here. And he'd have said, this is who it is. Because, hey, God, already, God does know, right? He knows exactly who it is. And he could have told us, but he didn't. So, again, the world is starting to follow him. And then, here's the thing. Notice in verse 4, so they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worship the beast saying, who is like the beast and who is able to make war with him? So now listen, not only do they worship the beast, they worship the dragon. They're worshiping Satan. Doesn't that sound an awful lot like, hey, we worship Jesus, but we also worship the Father, right? Kind of that same thing, that whole satanic false God, false worship of going on, and that's what's happening. And then, listen, then they say, who is like him, right? And then he says, who is able to make war, uh, uh, make war with, the, with him? Every time I read that, here's what I think. You might want to read chapter 19 and 20, because I know who's able to make war with him. It's called Jesus is going to come and make war with him and put him in the lake of fire forever. So, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. I, I, I wrote in my margin here, Jesus, when it says who's able to make war with him. So people are amazed, but think about this. People are drawn into that. This isn't just make-believe. It's not just a fairy tale. The world is drawn in. And think of where we're at in our world, not just, you know, hey, definitely culturally in the United States, but worldwide. Man, there's just such a movement to do away with truth. People do not want to have truth. They don't want to stand on truth. Hey, how many times do you hear, you can have your truth and I'll have my truth? That doesn't work. And listen, all of those who are wanting to do away with absolutes and truth, they're going to follow after this beast, and they're going to be duped into that. And to me, that's a frightening thing, and yet we're headed down there. And so, listen, I think maybe, maybe 25 years ago it was kind of hard to think about. Now today, it's not hard to think about people being duped and people going in that direction. Just because, you know, look at, look at just even what's happened recently. You know, in my mind, when we look at what's happened recently with this whole Israel-Hamas thing and how many young people are chanting from the river to the sea, not even knowing what they're doing. They don't, you know, most of them don't even know what they're saying. They don't even know what they're doing. They're just young people. Hey, I was young once, a few years ago, and I remember, hey, I remember getting involved in protests. I remember taking sides, and you know what? I was really stupid. And that's just young people. You're influenced and you go in a direction. And so think about how easy it's going to be for this one to come and dupe the world. So then, verse 5 says, and he was given a mouth uh, speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. So number one, first of all, this beast is empowered by Satan, right? He's the power behind him. And then it tells us that he was given a mouth to speak, and he was given authority for 42 months. Who gave him that mouth, and who gave him that authority? God did. Hey, he's got nothing on his own. He was given that ability, and he's given the ability to speak these blasphemous words, and he's going to reign for 42 months, which is three and a half years. 
Again, we're stuck on that, our, our kind of understanding. We've hit the halfway point in tribulation. Now we're looking at the future three and a half years, and that's all the authority he's given. And so, and he's going to ramp things up, and we'll talk about it a little later. And so, listen, he's doing that. Verse 6 says, then he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God and he, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. That blows my mind. Again, today, think about today how people speak against God, they speak against anything that represents God, and especially those who follow God. They're, you know, they're not just anti-God, they're anti-anything that would stand for God, or especially when we talk about Jesus. So he says, hey, he's gonna do that, and then verse seven says, it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. So now we look at, and people say, see the church is there because he's making war against the saints. Just because it says saints doesn't mean the church is there. As a matter of fact, do a little bit of a word study in the New Testament and see how many times the word saint, the original word in the original language, that word is used to describe the church. I'll give you a hint. Less than one. It's not you, hey, it's not used, we do that all the time. Paul may address the saints, but he never addresses the church as the saints. So think about that. And so saints simply means this, people who are saved. I've never denied, nobody ever denies people are gonna be being saved during the tribulation. I think that's gonna be one of the greatest times of revival, historically speaking, that there's ever been or ever will be. So it's gonna be intense, but he's gonna make war. Listen, this beast is going to try and do away with everyone who believes in Jesus. He's gonna work overtime at it. That's why I think when people tell me they're firm post-tribbers, I think by the time the end of the tribulation, they're not gonna be a whole lot to rapture. So you know, you can kind of go that direction if you want, it's okay. But he's gonna make war and it says, listen, he's gonna, he's gonna come against them and he's gonna overcome them and then here's the scary part, and he was given authority, or authority was given him, once again given him, over every tribe, tongue, and nation. In other words, this is going to be a world ruler. That is going to happen uh, during the tribulation, and people are going to, you know, just this, seek after this guy and, and gather together. Crowds are gonna come around him and rejoicing at what he's doing. And so, hey, it's gonna be over everybody. And then it says, verse eight is kind of to me uh, a, a, a sort of an exciting thing. He says, hey, he was given authority over every uh, tongue and tribe, tongue and nation. And then all who dwell on earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of the life of the Lamb, slain be from the foundation of the world. Oh. You know who's not gonna worship him? Everybody whose name is in that book. They're not gonna worship him. That's telling me believers are not gonna be duped. They're not gonna go that direction. So, you know, in my mind, here's what I think. Number one, right now, even today, I think we should make sure our name's in, the, in this book of life. I think we want to make sure of that. In other words, make your election and calling sure. We need to, there's nothing wrong with kind of doing an evaluation of where we're at spiritually. It always bothers me when people say, you shouldn't have any doubts. It's okay if you doubt. It's okay if you have questions, if that leads you to the cross. But we should make our salvation, we should be sure of it. I want to know my, my lamb. My name is in the lamb's book of life. Also, greater than that, I want to make sure other people's name is in that book. And I want to witness and I want to testify. I want to get as many names in there as I can. And you know, hey, I think if God gave me the opportunity, I'd be writing in that book. But he doesn't. How do we get people's names in that book? We share we share our faith, we witness to those we come in contact with. So if your name's in the book, you're safe. And then also notice this, because I think it's important. He says, hey, in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. We need to understand something. 
This whole plan of our salvation was God's plan from before he created. He had a plan of salvation. You know, some people, I've heard people teach this and people talk about this, like God originally wanted to just work through Adam and Eve. So he created Adam and Eve, put them in a perfect environment, made them perfect, and they walked along, and then they blew it. And so God said, I don't know what to do. Adam and Eve blew it. So then he had a guy build a boat, right? And had a guy get in a boat and do that. And then that didn't work out. So then he came up with this guy, Abraham. Are you kind of going with me? And that didn't work out. Then he came up with Moses and the nation of Israel. And that didn't work out. So finally he comes up. I know, I'll send my son. No, when was his son slain? from the foundation of the world. This is God's plan A from the very beginning, and Jesus was his plan for our salvation, and praise the Lord for that. So here's what he says, man. All whose names were not written in the book of life, they followed after the Antichrist. And then notice he says in verse nine, and if anyone has an ear, let him hear. Oh, that's interesting. Do you know what's missing? We've heard this a lot. Didn't we hear this a whole bunch when we were studying the seven churches? But what did it say? Everyone who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's not here this time. Here it just said, if you got ears, which I'm looking around, most of you do. If you have an ear, he says, let him hear. We need to hear and understand what's going on. And then he makes this profound statement. He says in verse 10, he who leads into captivity shall go into captivity, and he who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Then the, here is the patience uh, and, the, and the faith of the saints. So here's what's going on. I believe verse 10 is talking about God's sovereignty and God working, and it's, the NIV says it this way, and I think the New American Standard's close to this too. It says, if anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity he will go. And if anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword he will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on part of the saints. So here's what he's saying. Hey, we need to follow God, and you know what? We need to know God's got this planned out, and God's got it worked out, and it's going to go exactly as he has it worked out. So he states that, so this is the first beast, this is the Antichrist. Now there's another one that's a little weird looking. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon, and he exercises all, uh, all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So now we get introduced to this other one. It, it, it doesn't say he's a lamb. It says he had two horns like a lamb. And he comes and he, and obviously it's telling us that he comes and he has authority, but he's pointing everyone to the first beast. This is the false prophet. This is, you know, again, the one who comes and pushes everyone that way. And then people wanna know, who's the false prophet, right? Who's the Antichrist? We know who the dragon is, the dragon Satan. But who's the Antichrist? We don't know. And if people want to know who the false prophet is, and you know, we make fun of it and say things in the past, we don't know who the false prophet is. It's going to be a person. I think it's going to be a real person. And it says, listen, he causes those to worship the first beast, and it's brought up again that deadly wound was healed. I don't think any way, listen, doesn't mean he was brought back to life. There's only one who was resurrected from the dead and ascended into heaven. So I don't think he's talking about that. He's just saying, hey, that's what it looks like. And maybe all of this was a, a spoof. Remember the two witnesses who were killed and then raised and then taken to heaven? And I think maybe this is a, you know, a, a just a copy in that. Satan never does anything you know, authentic. He always copies and he always does that. So you have that going on. And then in verse 13, here's an important part. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of man. Oh, 
hey, he does some great signs, and he makes fire come down. Again, sounds like the prophets, and he's doing those things in verse 14, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth. Remember, those who dwell on the earth aren't people just living here. They're people who are bought into the world system. They're bought into this whole thing. And he says, hey, he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image uh, to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. So now here's what they're saying. Man, they're saying this guy is doing some signs and wonders. He's doing amazing things. He's a false prophet. You know what that tells me is we need to be careful. We need to be careful when we start following signs and wonders, when we start just looking for that. Hey, I'm not one who's saying God doesn't do miracles or God shouldn't do miracles. I'm saying we have to be careful what we follow. We need to be men and women of the truth, and we need to know the truth, and we need to have discernment. If there was ever an age where we needed discernment, it's right now. And especially, uh, you know, in, Revel- or in the tribulation especially. But right now we need discernment. There's so much stuff going on. And I just remember, I remember even in the late 80s, early 90s, the uh, whole work of the vineyard movement and how they had a course on miracles, right? They wrote a book, A Course on Miracles. And, you know, last time I checked, nobody in the Bible ever took a course on how to do a miracle, they just did them, right? God just worked through them and miracles happened. And I, I believe, listen, I believe that's the way. I don't believe, and now we have, hey, we have the Bethel has their school of, of supernatural working. And, and, and once again, be careful what you follow. Signs and wonders are not always the answer. And again, I don't want to say they never happen, but hey, so many are seeking after false signs and wonders false prophets. We have the big movement today within Christianity, the new apostolic reformation saying apostles are still around, prophets are still around. You know, hey, I I look into that stuff and here's what I think. Here's a false prophet. And there will be false prophets. The Bible talks about even in that day. So, hey, we need to be careful when we're following after. And many are going to come. Listen, Matthew 24 says this. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Or 2 Thessalonians, the coming of the lawless one uh, is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Hey, that stuff's going to happen. And so now here it's happening. And then he tells everybody, he tells everybody, hey, let's get together and make this image. I know, we'll make an image. So you know what, as I was studying this this week, I kind of got started, you know, I started thinking about things. I wonder who that false prophet really is. And I kind of came up with Elon Musk. People are going, are you crazy? Well, Elon Musk just built this robot, right? His company has this robot, Optimus. I don't know if you watched Optimus much, but it's pretty interesting. Maybe that's the image of the beast. And going on, I'm joking. Please, don't (laughs) quote me. Don't leave here today going, Pastor Pat thinks the false prophet is Elon Musk. But, hey, he has a make an image, and the reason, kind of the reason I go that way, look, he makes this image, and... and, uh, and uh, has all of those uh, uh, worshiping it. And then it says in verse 15, and he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. See, not only is there gonna be this image, this image is going to, quote, come alive. That's why I kind of went Elon, right? Because his image kind of comes alive. So you have that going on. Now, listen, that's freaky. And again, people are going to follow that. And then it says that the, image, uh, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Oh. I believe this image that he makes is going to be set up in the temple. And I believe, again, Daniel chapter 9, Matthew chapter 24, 2 Thessalonians all talk about the abomination that causes desolation. 
Daniel talked about it. Then Jesus said, when you see the abomination, we looked at this last week, when you see the abomination that causes desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, here's what he said. Hey, if you're a Jew, you need to put on your running shoes and you need to get out of town and you need to get away from Jerusalem as far as possible to save yourself. What does it say here? If they don't worship the beast, what's gonna happen? They're gonna be killed. You're either gonna worship the beast or you're gonna die. And again, and think of John writing this in John's day. What was going on in John's day? Hey, they were persecuting Christians. They were persecuting Christians for not worshiping Caesar. So hey, this had to really strike a chord with him as he's writing this and seeing this. And then it tells us, hey, in verse 16, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, that, and that no one uh, may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom, let him who understands calculate the number of the beast, for, the, for it is the number of man, his number is 666. There's a big thing, right? And so a lot of us kind of focus on that. And it's kind of interesting, John says we need to calculate the, to figure out the number, and then he goes, here's the number. So you don't have to calculate a long time. Here's the number, 666. So again, historically, Everybody's trying to figure out. Everybody's like, okay, he told me to calculate, so I need to understand something. So then people do the alphanumeric thing, and every letter has a number representation, and then you take people's names, and you know. I remember when it was Henry Kissinger, it was so weird, when Henry Kissinger was gonna be the Antichrist, right? And people said, now if you take his name, and you add up all of the letters, and you add them up, and then you divide them by 12, and then you multiply that by four, and then you divide again by three, and then you multiply it by two, you come up with 666. I'm thinking, man, that's a lot of work. <laughs> so I don't think he quite said that, and I know I exaggerated that, but that's what people were doing, trying to figure it out. Once again, if we were supposed to know, God would give us that. And then, hey, people are not gonna buy, sell, or do anything, you know, without the number, and they're gonna receive the number either they're on their forehead or on their right hand, and you know, you have that going on. So, hey, I've been around a while, I remember when barcodes first came out. Remember, how many of you remember going to the grocery store and they typed, they took everything in. They look at the price, right? Look at the price. Remember how long that used to take? And then do you remember when barcodes came out? Here's what everybody did. If you add up all those numbers, they come up to 666. And it's the mark of the beast. And we need to, you remember that? And then, and then it was, you know, and then it was this, and then it was that. And hey, I kind of understand, it's intriguing, but here's the thing. You're not gonna get the mark of the beast by accident. It's not just gonna, it's not gonna be, you know, an accidental thing. You're gonna take it on purpose, and you're gonna do this on purpose. Now some people, here's kind of a funny thing I thought of the other day. I purchased something, I don't know where I was, and I bought something, and I'm a guy, I use Apple Pay all the time. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but I, hey, I have a watch, and it's great, man. I just use my watch, and I go, dink, and walk out. That's awesome. And then I went, oh, no. <laughs> but here's the thing. That's why I always have my watch on my left hand, because he said right hand. So I'm very careful where to put my watch, and I don't have the mark. But hey, all of that stuff, we start thinking of all of those things. It's not gonna be some accidental thing. When we get the mark of the, or when people get the mark of the beast, they're gonna know what they're doing and they're gonna take it. So, wrapping all this up, what's the conclusion we come up with? Number one, we've got two more main players in the book of, of, of Revelation in the time of the tribulation. We have the dragon, Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. Now we're gonna move on. Hey, we're gonna be able to move on and look at things because now they're laid out. We have Israel. We know Israel's going to be in trouble, going to have a hard time because of this satanic trinity coming against them, and that's gonna happen. But what do we draw from this? Some people say, okay, so I got that, so what? Here's what we, I think we need to take home. We need to take home this thing about a person's name written in the book of life of the Lamb. 
And we need to be people, number one, make sure our name's in there. And only you can be sure of that. Only you can do that. But then, let's try and get people into that book of life. That should be our goal. Our goal should not be trying to figure out who the Antichrist or who the false prophet is. Our goal should be, how many people can I tell about Jesus this week? And how many people can I share with? And not just to get numbers, but hey, Man, I, I don't want anybody to suffer through these things. I don't want anybody to go to the lake of fire. I want everybody, I, I, you know, I wish kind of there was this universalism, but hey, I want everybody in heaven. And so let's get as many people as we can and let's make that our goal as we read and understand. Because here's what I know, chapter 13 is really gonna happen. It's really gonna take place and it's really gonna take place on this planet. And so we need to do what we can to keep people from suffering and going through that. Hey, let's stand up and pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. And Lord, just as the power of your word and how good your word is. And I do pray, I pray for myself and I pray for my brothers and sisters standing here right now that we would be those people that, God, we're convinced that our name is in the book of life that we would rest assured in that and, and we would have that assurance. And then God, I pray that we would reach out to our community, to those around us. Lord, we would reach out to them and share the good news of Jesus Christ with people we come in contact with. I thank you. I thank you that you challenge us. I thank you for chapters like this that cause us to stop and think and think about where we're at with you and think about what we're doing right now in this generation, in our culture, in our town, Lord, and, and that you would be glorified through us. And I'm gonna ask everyone to stay in an attitude of prayer and if you are here today and you've never asked Jesus Christ to forgive your sins and, and come into your life, then you know what, man? You picked a great day to come to church because there's a little bit of here that could be kind of frightening and, and getting scared is okay. I think it's all right, but hey, there's truth. And here's the truth. Here's just the simple, raw truth. That Jesus Christ died for sinners. And so, number one, you need to admit to God that you know you're a sinner. And I don't need to harp on that. You know you're a sinner. You may not want to admit it, but you, you know you're a sinner. And then you need to recognize the fact that your sin has offended a holy and righteous God. And because you've offended a holy and righteous God, what you deserve is his wrath. That's what the Bible says. You deserve the wrath of God because you've offended him. And that's scary because this wrath, it lasts forever. The great news is that Jesus Christ came, went to the cross, and he took the wrath of God that you deserve, the wrath of God that I deserve, he took it upon himself. And now here this morning, here's what he says. Hey, I got a book, and I wanna put your name in it. But you gotta trust me. You gotta put your faith in me, in what I did for you. So if you wanna do that, I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. And you say this prayer, listen, you repeat this prayer after me, and I know some people say, are you putting words in my mouth? What kind of, I'm just trying to help you out. And hey, you can say this prayer out loud. You can say it silently. It's not volume that matters. What matters is it's got to come from your heart. You need to be sincere about making this decision. If you're backslidden this morning, you need to come on home, man. You picked another great day to come back to church. Come home. Come back to Jesus. If you're watching online, you can say the prayer right where you're, right where you're at. You don't have to be here in this building. Let's say this prayer. Jesus Today I confess to you I am a sinner. I'm sorry that I sinned against you. And right now, I'm asking you to forgive me. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you today for your forgiveness. And now I want you to come into my heart and change me. Jesus, I'm asking you to come into my life and guide me. Today, 
I want you to be my Lord and my Savior.